Good morning. We are going to be continuing a study that we started at the beginning of this year. We have some visitors that are with us, and we're very, very thankful for your attendance with us this, this morning. As we consider the idea of our identity, who are we as Christians? When we say that that's what we are, we say we are a Christian, what is it that we are defining ourselves as? That's what we've set aside this year to try to discover. And some of the things that we've already come to understand is we are the church. And we looked at some of the different ways that that is used in the Bible to define a group that was the body of Christ. That we were uh, a, a part of this body that is headed by Christ. He makes the decisions, but we are one with one another. We have different purposes. We have different Goals. We have different things that 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 guide us, or that 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 we facilitate in that body. But we have one head that guides us through it all. We have discovered that we were called out. That we had once lived in darkness, and we have been called into light. We have been called into a transformed and changed life. And we discovered that we have been made ambassadors. That we are to reflect the glory of God. In this world, shining as, as those who are there to tell others about the mission and the purpose and the goodness of our God. We've, we've looked at various aspects of what it means to be Christians. And today is going to be no different. We're going to consider another aspect of our identity. In the Bible, it is very clear that the human family is depicted and created to reflect something about the eternal Father. In Ephesians chapter 3, in verses 14 and 15, Paul says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. Jesus would use some of that same language. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 9 through 11, he talked about how fathers know how to do good. If fathers know how to give good gifts, if fathers know how to care for their children, surely the Heavenly Father knows how to take care of you. He knows how to give you that which is good. The Hebrew author in Hebrews chapter 11, I'm sorry, chapter 12, he makes this great argument about discipline and how earthly fathers discipline children because they were their children. They belonged to them. They had a, an interest in them. They, they loved them and wanted them to grow in a way that was good and reflected the family in a good way. And God likewise disciplines us as His children. But we are not His children. And that's what I want us to come to think about this morning. As we consider who we are, we will consider that we are the adopted children of God. And I hope that through the course of this, we will learn more about our identity, and we will learn more about the inheritance that we have as people who have been, who have been grafted into this relationship and into this family, and we will learn more about our mission. That's what I want to share with you today as we reflect on who we are as the adopted children of God. But let me first start out by pointing out this lesson begins with a startling truth. Your adoption has been contested. There are those who desire in monumental ways to turn your affection away from the Lord who has adopted you and back to your biological family, so to speak. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 says, Be strong in the Lord and the strength of His might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Paul uses all of this to remind the, the, the Christians that they were engaged in a struggle. They were engaged in a struggle, not against worldly forces, but against heavenly forces. But what I want you to recall is when he does that, when he brings that language up, it wasn't the first time that he was using it in the Ephesian letter. He began in the Ephesian letter reminding them, that's what you came from. That's where you were. In darkness, in, in captivity to a world of wickedness, you were dead in your sins. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. 
describes it this way. Starting in verse 1, You were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desire of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. This was your biology. This was your nature. You were fleshly children of wrath. And what I want us to come to understand is while we have been adopted into the family of God, there are powers that want you to ignore that adoption and to return back to your family that you came from. They want you to ignore the Father who wants you to join His heavenly family today. And so as I talk about this idea of being adopted into God, and we discuss different aspects of that, I want you to subconsciously hear another word. Adoption is about war. Adoption is about a battle that is waging around us. One that we are grafted into a family that has committed itself to to fighting and standing against the forces of evil. And if we are adopted into that family, we are being called into service to fight alongside our Father. Begin to see that. I want us to begin by understanding of those three things. Number one, our identity as an adopted child of God. And Romans 8 is going to be such a pivotal point in us coming to see that. We're going to spend a lot of time here. We're going to get out of Romans 8 a few times, but if you want to put a a bookmark in Romans 8, we're going to keep coming back to this again and again. And it begins in verse 2. Romans 8 and verse 2, which says, For in the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. And in that is this understanding that our identity as an adopted child of God is an identity of freedom. We have been set free. But did you notice that it wasn't because of what you did? It wasn't because of your, your remarkable qualities. It wasn't because of your ability to set yourself free. It wasn't because you showed yourself worthy to be chosen for that. We were set free from the law of sin and death by the law of the Spirit of life in Christ. This is not about who we are. This is not about our actions. This is not about our performance. This is about the love and the grace of a Father who has brought us into His family. And Paul continues to make that argument as he goes through chapter 8. He begins drawing our minds there. And Nathan, Nathan led us in that as he read verses 12-17. through 17. I want to look specifically at verses 14-15 through 15 at a, for a moment. Which says, for all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. There is some very descriptive language in those two verses. And for just a brief moment, I would ask you to read them to yourself again and see which words stand out to you. Because to me, there are words like led by the Spirit of God. A description of who we are as people brought into this family. That we are living and walking by the Spirit of the family. In the ways that it wants to go. In the ways that reflect the family and specifically the Father's character and nature. That has become who we are as adopted children of God. We walk in His ways. I would also think about words such as you no longer live as slaves to fear. That there has been a remarkable transformation in us. Having been adopted into this family that is different from the family we once belonged to. is different from the idea of being with, without family. That has fundamentally changed us. We'll talk more about that in a moment. But that is a powerful phrase that sticks out to me. You don't live any longer as slaves of fear. 
But for me, what stands out the most is you live as sons who cry out, Abba, Father. That phrase, Abba, Father, is one of the most misunderstood phrases in the Bible. Sometimes treated as an infantile sort of cooing. Like a little child that, that crawls up to dad and giggles, dada. But housed in the Greek word, Abba, is not the sense of some cute little relationship in joyful moments. There was a Greek word for that. A Greek word that Paul would have known. That Paul could have used. But he used a much more specific word. Inside of the idea of Abba is a response that transcends obligation and fixes itself in an intimate relationship. There's a book that I would encourage everyone to read by a man named Russell Moore called Adopted for Life. Russell writes about the experience of adopting two one-year-old boys from a Russian orphanage. Boys that had been selected by a judge and been placed into the care of Russell and his wife Maria. And in the book, he writes about the time when he went to visit them. When they visited this Russian orphanage for the very first time. And in the pages of that story are a wonderful depiction of Abba, Father. He says, when Maria and I first walked into the orphanage where we were led to the boys the Russian courts had picked out for us to adopt, we almost vomited in reaction to the stench and squalor of the place. The boys were in cribs, in the dark, lying in their own waste. The reality of children living in orphanages around the world is disgusting. It's heart-wrenching. I'm not going to make it through this sermon in one piece. Just know that. But what Russell describes next, as they met the children, and they got to spend time speaking to them, and and talking to them, knowing that they don't understand the words that we're saying. They're one year old. But he describes them parting ways that truly emphasizes the terrible nature of being fatherless and the impossible reality of the cry of Abba, Father. He says, of all the disturbing aspects of the orphanage in which we found our boys, one stands out above all the others in its horror. It was quiet. The place was filled with an eerie silence. Quieter than the Library of Congress. Despite the fact that there were cribs full of babies in every room, if you listened intently enough, you could hear the sound of gentle rocking as babies rocked themselves back and forth in their beds. They didn't cry because no one responded to their cries. So they stopped. And it's dehumanizing in its horror. The first moment I knew the boys received us in some strange and preliminary way was the moment we walked out of the room for the last time on that first trip. When little Maxim, now Benjamin, fell back in his crib and cried. The first time I'd ever heard him do it. It was because, for whatever reason, he seemed to think he'd, hurt, he'd be heard. And for whatever reason, he no longer liked the prospect of being alone and in the dark. 
Brethren, this is our cry of Abba, Father. Ezekiel chapter 16 defines God's way of seeing us in the dark, lying in our filth. He says in verse 3, The Lord God of Israel says, Your origin and your birth are from the land of the Canaanite. Your father was an Amorite. Your mother a Hittite. As for your birth, on the day you were born, your navel cord was not cut, nor were you washed with water for cleansing. You were wrapped with salt. You were not wrapped with salt or even wrapped in clothes. No eyes looked with pity on you to do any of these things for to to have compassion on you. Rather, you were thrown out into the open field. You were abhorred on the day you were born. That's a picture of Israel in Egyptian captivity with no one who loved them, with no one who cared for them, and a God who saw them in their filthy and, and disgusting state and said, as He goes on to say, Live. I bring life. Brethren, that is us. Children who do not have a right to cry out to a father. A people who have given up because no one hears our cries. And a father who brought us hope. A father who says, not only will I be in a relationship where I have an obligation as a father to care for you, to provide life for you, to do good for you. I'll be more than your father. I'll be your Abba. We have been adopted into the family of God. And if we need further depiction that Abba is more than just a a cute phrase, I would encourage you to go read the life of Jesus. When Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, as blood vessels burst in His face, as sweat like blood drops to the ground, and in His anguish and in His despair, with the weight of the world and the cross in front of Him, He cries out, Abba, Father. This is guttural. This is life dependent. This is complete devotion. But it is built and based in the knowledge that you love me when no one else did. And you have given me hope. And you have given me reason to cry out again. This is who we are as Christians. People who have been adopted by God and can cry out in full confidence and know that He hears. People who can live. Knowing as Paul continues in Romans 8, if God is for us, who can be against us? What can separate us from His love? Nothing. When we cry out, He hears because we have been adopted into His family. But there are other things that we need to recognize about this idea of being identified with the family of God through adoption. Paul began this whole picture in Romans chapter 8, verse 12 with these three simple words. So then, brethren. The brethren that he is speaking to is the church in Rome. A church with which years earlier had experienced the exodus of every Jew when the emperor cast the Jews out of Rome. But now they have been allowed to come back. And we have this new sort of demographic that we're trying to get to understand. How do Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians work together? And Paul writes to them and says, brethren, time and time again, Do we know what that means? I mean, I think we think that we do. Because we speak to one another in such ways. Brother and sister so-and-so. And And maybe we do that to 
correlate a, a special sort of acquaintance. I imagine a lot of times we do that because we've forgotten somebody's name and it's a lot easier just to say, hey, brother. But the Israelites knew exactly what that term meant. We are a family. Because we, as 12 brothers chosen by God to become a blessing to the world through this great and mighty nation of priests and kings that He was ordaining and that He was leading and that He was filling with His blessing. We know what it means as Israelites, as Jews, to be brethren. But Paul's talking to Gentiles. Pig-eating Gentiles. Uncircumcised Gentiles. The antithesis of the Israelite Jewish mindset of who could be a brother. And I think that's the reason why Paul uses the language that he does. Brethren, we have been adopted into the family of Christ. Both you who were, were born in a covenant relationship through a descendant ancestry to Abraham, and you who have been born into a world <coughs> filled with darkness and filled with every manner of thing which goes against the laws that He provided. We are brethren. And in Galatians chapter 5, Paul kind of doubles down on that sort of language. He says, you are not called to freedom, brethren, for you were called to freedom, brethren, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. In this passage, as Paul talks about this, he uses this language such as brethren, and then a very hot topic in Galatia is the idea of circumcised. Must the Gentile Christians be circumcised to truly belong to Christ? And he's going to really emphasize throughout this the idea of warring against spiritual life and fleshly life. Drawing their minds back to what they're fighting over are fleshly things, literally, but also figuratively, we can fight over fleshly things as well, but we are a part of a spiritual family. We have been adopted to be led by the Spirit of God as a part of God's family. And that changes the way that we talk to one another. Now as he goes on, he gets into a section that we love to think about. The fruit of the Spirit. But what I want you to consider is he begins that in a way that, just, that needs to draw to our attention that he is contrasting the family that we once used to belong to with the family that we are now in. And he is bringing some things that should make us sick to our stomach when he talks about sin. And you understand that when you know your family's history. If you have a family history of heart disease, you have a, 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 a father in your family or grandfather that at a very early age passed away from a heart attack, heart attack, every time that you get a little bit of tightness in your chest, you get a pit in your stomach. Is that what this is? Or you have a mother who very early on, because of dementia, began losing her, her memories. And again, when you start to become forgetful, you get nervous, you get concerned because you know where you come from. You know your family history in this. Think about what Paul says next. In Ephesians 19 through 21. Now, the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousies, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. This is where this gets scary in Galatians. 
Because what it's doing, the same thing that the Gospel is doing, is revealing that our previous father had venomous fangs. And we have the ability and oftentimes reflect just how much of a serpent we can act like. Whenever these sorts of things make themselves visible in our lives, and we treat our neighbors with contempt because of the things that they have that are nicer than ours, and we're filled with envy, and we, we speak abusively to those that we're in relationships with, and our, our husbands or our wives, and we, we blash out with them with anger, and we're just quick to be involved in all sorts of fighting and arguing, arguing with one another. When we treat the world as if it owes us something and we're going to take and use and abuse through sexual immorality and through violence. Brethren, that ought to make us sick because it is a reminder. It is a reminder of where we came from. It is a reminder of the family that we have been brought out of we've been rescued from, that we have been adopted from. It needs to get our attention. And just like the man that says, well, maybe it's just a little bit of, of acid reflux that's causing my tightness. We must not dismiss it. We must not dismiss our abuse of others as, oh, well, it was just a little joke. We must not dismiss our lustful intent as it's something that I, I'll, get, I'll get a handle on one day. We have been adopted into the family of God to reflect and to show the character of our Father being led by His Spirit. When we see these things in our lives, and especially when we see these things amongst our brethren, when we treat our brethren this way, who are our fellow adopted children of God like us, it needs to get our attention. Titus chapter 2, 11 through 12 comes to mind, which again enforces we are not here by entitlement. We are in this family by grace, and it's a grace that we ought to be learning from and being taught by to deny ourselves from living and treating others the way that Satan does, and to live godly in this world, amongst our brethren, amongst our family, amongst our friends. But did you notice Did you notice how Paul ended that section? In verse 21, he said that these who live according to their the way of the world according to their father, the Satan. Those who are living in this way in the, after the, the works of the flesh will not inherit the kingdom of God. Let us talk for a moment about what adoption as children of God means, not just for our identity, but for our inheritance as well. Romans chapter 8, verse 16. If you'll turn your Bibles there, we'll continue for just a moment. But... Ultimately, I think the way that we want to answer this question, what is our inheritance? Well, it's heaven. It's, it's the big mansion with God. You know the one, the gold one that's silver lined. I've got it up there waiting for me. That's my inheritance with God. And you are absolutely right. An eternal residence with our Father is our inheritance. And with, with thinking about it in those terms... While we are true, we greatly diminish the reality of what He is speaking about when He speaks about the inheritance of the saints, the inheritance of the sons of God with God. We don't see to the fullest extent what He's talking about when we minimize it. That's a weird way to think about that. Minimizing it to solely heaven. I know it's a weird way to think about it, but if you allow me to follow this thought through, I think we'll see exactly what I mean. And I'm going to do that by again sharing another story from Russell's book. He says, when Maria and I at long last received the call that the legal process was over, we returned to Russia to pick up our sons. We found that their transition from orphanage to family was more difficult than we had supposed. We dressed the boys in outfits our parents had bought them. 
We, we nodded our thanks to the orphanage personnel, and we walked out into the sunlight to the terror of the two boys. They'd never seen the sun. They'd never felt the wind. They'd never heard the sound of a car door slamming or felt like what it must be like to be carried along a road at 100 miles an hour. I noticed that they were shaking and reaching back to the orphanage in the distance. I whispered to Sergei, now Timothy, that place is a pit. If only you knew what's waiting for you. A home. A home with a mommy and a daddy who love you. Grandparents and great-grandparents and cousins and playmates and McDonald's Happy Meals. But all they knew was the orphanage. It was squalid. But they had no other reference point. It was home. He goes on to say, we knew the boys had acclimated to our home that they trusted us when they stopped hiding food in their high chairs. They knew there was going to be another meal coming. They no longer had to fight for the scraps. This had become their new normal. But brethren, focus on that last line. I still remember those little hands reaching for the orphanage. And I see myself there. The idea of inheritance is tangled up. I apologize, I didn't skip that one, I should have. The idea of inheritance is tangled up in who your father is. This is the biblical worldview in which Paul writes about inheritance. Who your father was was vital to that information. The Bible regularly reminds us of this. Fathers pass their inheritance down to their children, specifically to their sons. And we like to try to, to make that a little bit more gender inclusive and say that they, they pass inheritance to the daughters as well. And in fact, there is an example of that. Zelophehad. Zelophehad's five daughters receive the inheritance because he has no sons. But the daughters were protected and received their inheritance through marriage through marrying a son who had been gifted his inheritance by the father. This is the picture again and again throughout the Bible. But it's a picture that is meant to instill survival. You have hope. You have a, a, a source of, of revenue, wealth. You have protection because you have an inheritance. And without that, when you become fatherless, when you become an orphan, you no longer have the system of survival. And so you are, by necessity, going to have to beg, borrow, more oftentimes thievery and stealing is the idea that people would, would have to resort to. You had to take care of yourself in whatever ways you could. Now imagine that you're this little orphan and out comes the king. And as he walks by, he looks at you and you're in your filth, you're dirty, you don't have clothes that have been washed, you are malnourished and you haven't eaten and you've probably got marks all over your body from being punished for all the, the thievery that you've engaged in to try to just... Feed yourself fundamental, necessary things. The king sees you in that state. He says, today, you are my son. Your inheritance is the kingdom. Yes, you get the castle. You get the fortress. You get, the, you, you get everything that comes, the residency of the king. But you know what that means? The inheritance means you get survival. You don't have to beg anymore. You don't have to steal anymore. Whenever the child is brought into the kingdom and is regularly caught trying to steal things out of the cupboard and hide them, and they come and they ask, why do you keep living this way? You're the son or the daughter of the king. It's yours. Just ask for it. And it belongs to you. Does that sound familiar? I would suggest that it does. 
In Romans chapter 8, verses 16 through 17, we have this realization. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him, so that we may also be glorified with Him. The King has come by and seen us and said, you're a part of my family. And the inheritance is yours. But we still live like the thieves and the beggars that we were. People that required to do everything on our own. And how miserably we failed at that then, we continue to fail at it now. But we have a a voice, an advocate for our past life saying, you don't really have anything. You don't really have all these blessings. He's bluffing. He won't give you anything. If you want it, you got to take it. If you want love, you have to go and you have to manufacture it. You can't trust people. You need to... to, And you can't be trust. You must deceive. That is the voice of Satan. That is the family we come from. And the reminder of the king, again, would come and say, why don't you just ask? Which is in James 4. What is the source of your quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? And you lust and do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, so you may spend it on your own pleasures. You adulteresses do not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Why is that? It is because God's adopted us out of the world. He's adopted us out of our past life. And yes, we have lived a traumatic life and it is hard to trust Him that He is going to provide for us and He is going to care for us. And we regularly lean back on our old identity to say, I will do what I have to do to get what I want. But the King, our God, our Father, is repeatedly coming to us with patience and with gentleness, reminding us, you're mine. You belong to me. Because I have adopted you. And when you cry, I hear. When you ask, I hear. Stop living Stop living as we used to live and recognize the inheritance that we have. That whisper that Russell mentioned in his book, you're not going to miss the orphanage. It's met with doubt. That's us. Doubting, we're not going to miss that. That's the Israelites. Doubting, we're not going to miss Egypt. Over and over and over again, throughout history, God is exemplifying Himself as the one that can ease those doubts, calling us, trust me, and trust what I am providing. Don't take our eyes off of Christ. Don't take our eyes and place them back on the squalor that we've been rescued from. Remember that we have been adopted. Remember that we have a great inheritance. A royal inheritance. We are heirs of heaven. But we are also heirs today. Back in Galatians chapter 2, we stopped short of the fruit of the Spirit. Let me ask you to Think about those in a moment in comparison to what we've been talking about, being adopted. If we think of the fruit or the the works of the flesh as a manifestation of the history of our biological life, our fleshly life in the family of Satan, what happens when we think about the fruit of the Spirit? Not as something that we must attain, acquire. I've got to. I've got to go and get that for myself. I've got to make that. I've got to make myself more joyful. I've got to make myself more gentle, as opposed to what James four called for us to do: to ask and recognize that we have an inheritance today. 
God provides us with joy, love, faith, kindness, gentleness, self-control, patience. He provides us, provides us with those things. But how does He do that? How often have you read that and thought, this is what I need to be, instead of reading and thinking, this is what I have been shown by my Father. My Father shows me joy. My Father shows me love. My Father shows me patience and kindness. My Father shows me self-control whenever I repeatedly act opposed to His will. My Father shows me gentleness. Why? Because that is my inheritance. My inheritance is Him and a life residing with Him in eternity. Brethren, adoption into the family of God says a lot about our identity and it says a lot about our inheritance. But as we wrap this up, we also need to recognize a few more things about what it says about our mission. And shocker, maybe no shocker, a sermon on adoption is a veiled attempt to be a sermon about adoption. That's our Father's business. Psalm 68, verse 5. A father of the fatherless and a judge for the widows is God in His holy habitation. So when you come to a passage like James 1 and verse 27, pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. We're talking about joining in to the work of our Father. We're talking about the work of His kingdom. This is not an attempt for me to say that every Christian needs to adopt. I think that would be foolhardy. For there are those that I know would have a great desire and have great physical hindrance. Maybe through age or through, through health that I would want to do that, but I am physically not capable. This is not an, an argument to say that every Christian that is adopted by God needs to adopt children. But here's what I am saying. And I want to say it clearly, and I want to say it definitively, that every child of God who has been adopted into the family of God needs to have a heart for adoption. Needs to have a desire for those that are fatherless. For those that live without knowing the reality of what God has done for us, both in a spiritual sense and in a physical sense, is required of me. Because I think when we live that way, that that has very real impact in the world around us. What does it mean? What does it mean to recognize that we have been adopted into the family of God and this is His mission to be a father to the fatherless and therefore God's work Dad, my father's work, that's my work. What does that mean? One, it means something to me. And it means something to the three elders, our pastors here. Ephesians chapter 4 says that we are here for a purpose. To equip the saints for the ministry of work. Brethren, that is a part of our task. It is to equip saints to work in the mission field of God which has a huge emphasis on assisting the fatherless. It means as a congregation, if we have a desire for the work of God, that we have a desire for the efforts of helping the fatherless become fathered. That we pray for that. That we reflect on that. That we seek opportunity to to encourage others and to prepare others and to teach others the benefit of that. And as individuals, as individual Christians, as I said in a past sermon, as my friend repeated, has, has said recently, we have a responsibility to be salt of the earth. Salt is not effective until it gets out of the shaker. As individuals, having a desire to help the fatherless means getting involved. I'm not here to mention organizations and groups, and we all know who I'm talking about. I'm not here to, to, to mention those. I'm here to say as individuals, you look for opportunity that you can work 
to do the Father's business. And there's two ways that you can do that. You can do that through getting involved, through helping a child find a home, through opening your own home to be a place where a child can find love and protection, a father and a mother to, to, to be that. We can, we can get involved in those ways. But recognize that that's a spiritual call as well. Recognize that there are many in this world who live spiritually as fatherless. They have a father who has rejected them. That desires no good for them. That wants only their destruction. And from the dawn of creation, He has done everything He can to ensure that. And they need to know that they have a Father that loves them and has sacrificed everything that they might be a part of His family. This is what it means to be adopted into the family of God. To join in to His work. If you are here this morning as a Christian, you are an adopted child of God. As a Christian, you are an heir of the blessings of this kingdom. Blessings that we receive right now. Blessings that have eternal ramifications. And as a Christian, you have a mission to join into your Father's work in caring for the fatherless wherever and whomever they may be. If you are here today and you are not a Christian though, let me take a moment to speak to you. For if you have not been baptized into Christ, Galatians chapter 3 talks about what that means. It's not something that we do as the church of Christ. It's not something that we do because, well, that's just what Christians do. The Bible details it in a very, very vivid way. Baptism is a clothing yourself with Christ. Those who have been baptized to Christ have put on Christ. You are sons of God. If you have not done that today, physically you may have a family. Spiritually, you are an orphan. And you are living in the darkest orphanage there is. A world that does not provide for you and does not care for you that allows you to try and soothe and take care of yourself, all the while not providing the basic things. You just, as if you're sitting in yourself. When those boys cried out, when that child cried out, and Russell heard the cry of his son. He records one more thing. He ran back in. He ran back in and he ran up to the child and he put his hand on his and he quoted John 14, verse 18. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Jesus' promise to us is I'm coming back. And yes, we still, as the family of God, live in this dark world. But we no longer live without hope. And for those of you who are not Christians today, that's what I want to invite you into. Is the hope that we have. That a father hears our cries. If you are here today, the Bible answer is cry out to Him. Acts 2 repeats that again and again. Cry out to Him. And those who cry, those who call on the name of the Lord will be heard and will be saved. Cry out to God for salvation by submitting to Him to be cleansed, washed of your sins, turning from a life devoted to the Father of this world, devoted to Satan, Devoted to trying to do things my way to a world where we submit ourselves to our adopted Father. He loves you. He is inviting you. If we can assist you with that, come forward as we sing together.